My name is Carlton King, and welcome to the Black Spy Podcast, the show that lifts the light on the world of secret intelligence, national security, and armed personal protection operations. A world that hitherto is close to you. So what we want to do in the show is let you understand how this world functions and what your part in it is. Today's show, what we're going to do is something dead simple. We're going to take questions from you guys, many of you who've read my book, Black Ops, the incredible true story of a British secret agent, have written in and said, what is this or what is that or how do things work? I've got with me here today my web engineer, Dan. He's gone through some of your questions and he's going to ask me those questions. I don't know what they are, it's for a bit of fun and hopefully you'll like the show. Dan, hi. Hi there, Carlton. How are you? Mate, thanks very much. Okay, so I think first and foremost, I'm looking through the questions that we've got from the public. I think the first question that most people want to know is, how accurate are shows such as Homeland, James Bond, compared to the real thing? That's a very good question. What I'd say is that Homeland, when it first started, which actually was an Israeli program which was taken to the US, was actually quite accurate in many ways. It did the CIA well, and in the Israeli version, obviously it carried out the work of Mossad and Shin Bet, so that's the security service and the secret intelligence service. So those bits on the American show, which is now very popular, were actually done quite well. But unfortunately, as with most shows, as time goes on, they seem to have to make things more and more, is the word exciting or is it just, I guess people could say over the top. So some of that is lost. But yeah, the beginning shows were actually very good and quite accurate. Now, if you want to take a look at the James Bond programs and movies, the concept is relatively accurate. So James Bond is a case officer like I was. And what happens is he goes around the world fighting whomever the United Kingdom government say they want him to tackle. And with that, he enlists the assistance of local security services or intelligence services, police services, whomever in the country is the one who functions and utilising that assistance, he carries out his work. So the basis is correct. Obviously, the storyline's a fantasy. Okay, that, that explains a lot. So if I were to ask you to explain your job role, for instance, how, how would you go about doing that? The advantage that I have and what is unique, which is why I say in the book, the incredible true story of a, a British secret agent, is that actually I've carried out three roles. So I've carried out the role of a spy in what in Britain is called the Secret Intelligence Service, better known as MI6. I've obviously carried out the role in the special branch from Scotland Yard of a counter-espionage individual. So somebody who wants to stop spies and somebody who wants to stop terrorists and somebody who wants to stop subversives. So that's the other side of that coin. And then in addition to that, I've also performed the role, and that was in, as I said, in special branch. And then I've also performed the role in SO1 Specialist Protection of what would in the US be the US Secret Service, which is protection of the Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, and in fact, US presidents and other presidents and prime ministers who come to Great Britain. So I've got actually three different roles. So this is what the show can do for you. In fact, more than three, because there's other bits I've done as well, which has all come together in the show. So I've got a massive overview of what happens in this secret world. And how did you initially get into this role? Were you approached by someone like you see in the movies and it's in a creepy room and they come over to you in a dark situation? Or was it you simply applied for the role and someone saw that maybe you had potential and you were taken on? Another good question. And again, it has to do with the fact that I was in several different roles. So in terms of the special branch, what happened is I was working in Germany and from little acorns, bigger things grow. And I was basically working for the Germans as well. They call a house detective. Now, I know that sounds crazy, but basically what it is, it's like a store detective. 
but you add a lot. If you see people stealing the store, or whatever, you arrest them, you fill out the papers, you send the forms off to what they call the Stadtsanwalt, which is the district attorney, and you then go to court with it. After doing this for a while, I, I thought, I like this idea of this game as a professional disc jockey, but I just was doing this during the day for fun. I said, like, I like the idea of this, but can I do it in more depth? So at the time, during the Cold War, the Americans had literally hundreds of thousands of soldiers and airmen, more than half a million stationed in Germany. So I went to the American forces and said, listen, can I work for you guys? Strangely, the person I spoke to said, listen, we'd love to have you fly over to New York. When you land at the airport in New York, go into the army recruiting barracks and sign up. I said, oh, I don't want to be in the army. You know, it's just like too much of a commitment being in the army. He said, it could be in the army, it could be in the air force. I said, is there some other way I could do it without actually signing my life away and being in the army of the earth? He said, yeah, okay. The Department of Defense, the U.S. Department of Defense, basically has land and property stores, petrol stations and housing areas, which all need to be investigated because there's massive crimes on them and we have our own investigative agency you can be part of that agency if you pass so i thought that sounds better yeah without me having to do that so what happened is i had an interview and the guy who ran the interview who became my boss an ex-senior fbi agent who had been part of the fbi's clandestine operations i.e he was an intelligence officer within the fbi and he basically hired me he said, yeah, you're the type of looks. So he sent me off for some training. I did several weeks, I think it was like 20 weeks of training and came into the organization. And it was this guy who told me about the special branch in Scotland Yard. He knew of the security service, which people will know as MI5, but he preferred the special branch because the special branch have police powers so they can arrest people and stuff like that. Whereas the security service have no such powers. So he said to me, if I were a Brit, I'd be in the special branch. I'm trying to do his American accent. Great guy. And he told me one of the best things I have ever been taught. He said, in this game, there's one thing you need to know, Carlton. It's CYA. Do you know what that means? I said, no, cover your ass. That's what he said. That's what I've always remembered. Always cover your ass. So that's how I got into applying for the special branch. So I applied to the British Embassy and they basically said, oh, sorry, my friend, it don't work like that. You can't join the special branch. You've got to join the Metropolitan Police. So London's Metropolitan Police. And if you're then lucky and extremely lucky, you may be chosen to be in the special branch by sitting their exams, their tests, their processes and all the rest of it. So I joined the Met, was sworn in as a police officer, a general officer. And then after two years, because you have to do two years as a regular officer, an application came in, what they call police orders. And there you could apply for special branch. Now, what I knew is that the applications were massive. And in my time, when I did mine, 1,200, 1,300 applied to go into the branch. Most, a lot were knocked off even before you sat the paper. So probably about 1,000 sat the paper, which you have. The first, in fact, there's five papers that ask a whole lot of difficult questions. And when you pass those papers, then there's another session which you go through. Then thereafter, there's a session where you have to write various aspects. Then you sit down, they whittle it down then to about 20. And then the 20 of us sat down in front of officers in the branch and they ask you various questions on the day. And then they whittle that down to 10 and 10 of us got in. So the attrition rate is massive. And then, of course, they then do what they call a developed vetting, which gives you the highest level of access to the secrets of the United Kingdom. But in order to get that, they want to look at what you did, what your parents do, what your brothers and sisters do, what your grandparents do, wherever you work. In my case, they sent people to Germany to speak to friends in Germany, employers in Germany. They spoke to the German police, to the German security service, and they try and look at everything to make sure you're not somebody who's been pushed in to try and take the role. So that's how I got into special branch. Then from there was lucky enough to obtain an application to come into the Secret Intelligence Service because they wanted a special branch officer, never done it before, and it was a unique role that had all the knowledge of countering terrorism and working in terrorism area and to work as a case officer, i.e. to do the James Bond role, to recruit agents, we call them agents, you'll probably think of them as informants, uh, and turn people against the organisations though in order to combat terrorism around the world. So. That's what I was doing. And in fact, counter-terrorism, counter-proliferation, counter-espionage. So to answer your question, 
that's how I got in there. And in special branch at the time, you also did protection. So I was trained also to be a protection officer. And then later I came into SO1 when I formed SO1 with about several other people when the special branch was disbanded and we then formed a protection body. So it's a roundabout thing, but that's how it happened. Now, in the old days, if you wanted to just be in MI6 itself or MI5, as a case officer, i.e. that's about the top third to the top quarter of the organisation, you either went to Oxford, Cambridge, St Andrews or Durham. And what would happen is somebody would tap you on the back, who was one of your tutors, and he'd say, have you ever thought about working for Her Majesty's Government? And that's how that used to work. So, and you were generally a member of the ruling elite. They generally knew who your parents were and your grandparents. And so you were brought into MI5 and MI6 in that way. So I'm a unique guy who came into that organization in a unique way. Like you say, you didn't really fit the mold. So did you notice that maybe you were perceived differently? because you didn't have that sort of background and also as well because you're black. Yeah, as far as I knew at the time, I was definitely the only black case officer. And in the organisation of, talking about MI6 now, uh, the intelligence service, in that organisation, there were a few black people in the other roles that support a case officer. Because basically what happens is there are many, many other roles that support a case officer's work. So you'll have people who are expert on computers, people who are expert locksmiths who can open locks and doors and everything. You'll have people who are expert in languages. You name it, they've got experts. So that's the expert element that you look for. Then there's another one, an administration unit. Now they are taken from general universities. They don't need to be Oxford, Cambridge or whatever. And these guys come in. Now, of that type of person, the other three quarters, there were, what I saw, probably about two or three black people, what I saw at my time. Now, the other thing you've got to understand is, in the case officer role, again, I saw maybe one or two working class people. Other than that, they're all higher echelon individuals from the middle to the upper middle to the ruling classes. You saw very few working class people. So my advantage in MI6, in Secret Intelligence Service, that I could understand why terrorists do things. Because often many of the terrorist people you deal with are people who haven't had a silver spoon in their mouth. So they see the world in a different way. And I could see that world that they could see. One, because I'm black and I could see how imperialism can deal with you in that issue. But two, because I was a working class guy and I could see how having hard knocks can make you think about if the system's fair. So there was that. Now, in coming into the regular police, obviously, the regular police is working class. So you came into it with a whole load of working class people. But in the special branch, again, it tended to be people from the middle to the upper middle classes. Now, there were some of us, a very few black, very few Asian heritage people who were in the branch. At that time, there were women more than black than Asian people, but again, relatively few in some parts of the branch, but quite, quite a few in others. But again, all of those people in there had to have a great interest in politics, were generally well-educated and potentially had degrees like myself. And they were people that were not the normal cut, if you will, for the police. Frankly, in the branch, I didn't see very much prejudice. In the regular police, there was quite a lot of prejudice. But then there was a hell of a lot of prejudice within every sphere in British society. So when I was a young fella, they had a thing called the colour bar and you couldn't be in certain things. It wasn't any difference really than the rest of British society at that particular time. Okay, so in a way, could you say that as a spy, maybe your blackness helped you in a way to evade suspicion, etc.? Absolutely. In spying, people didn't think that, number one, you were British, and number two, that you were a spy. So that's the first thing. Now, they maybe thought, and I can remember some instances where I was working with those people, and they think, you're, they said he's British, but I think he must be an American. So people were thinking like that. I can remember sitting at the Olympic Games in 2008 when I was in charge of running the security for the United Kingdom in Beijing. And we sat down, fully enough myself, and an army major who I'd brought with me, who was an explosive expert, and we wanted to make some protection for the building we were in. And he was of Chinese heritage, this major. So we sat there and we had the chief of the police of Beijing and they've got another type of police in China called the People's Armed Police and, and the deputy chief of the People's Armed Police. And we were sat around and the chief said, in Chinese, of course, and I was taught by my interpreter, said, I thought you said these were British. They're Americans, aren't they? Because he saw a black fella, an, an Asian fella. So he thought, they must be Americans. 
because that was the concept. So you mentioned earlier that you'd have specialists in different areas. So for instance, you'd bring someone in to pick locks and someone who may be a firearms expert, etc. What lengths would you go to? Would there be people with makeup? Would there be prosthetics used? And then also talk us through how you would maybe infiltrate, say, a terrorist cell. Well, that's quite interesting because, again, it depends on what area you're talking about. Are you talking about working within Special Branch? Are you talking about working within the Secret Intelligence Service? I'll just say X from now on for the Secret Intelligence Service because it makes it easier. MI6, are you talking about working within MI5? Depending on the area you're talking about, it that works differently. If you were talking about when I was a case officer in MI6, okay, so I'm now the guy who's going out around the world trying to do things. But generally with my operations, what I'm doing is I'm trying to find an individual who is already in a terrorist group, if it's terrorism I'm dealing, let's say Al-Qaeda I'm dealing with, or non-aligned Mujahideen, sometime Mujahideen, or, I don't know, N17, or the Abu Nidal group, all are very dangerous terrorist organisations that have been, been with. So if you're looking for these people in the, you look for somebody in the organisation already, and then what you try and do is turn that person to provide you with information. Now, this is obviously very dangerous. Because you may think you've turned the person, and the person is actually not turned at all. He's playing a double on you. And therefore, he may say, come and meet me in, I won't say a country. Yeah. So you come and meet that fella somewhere. And next minute, you've got an orange jumpsuit on and there's a chap with a, a sword over your head. So that's how you've got to try and understand people. You've got to try and figure, do you understand why people will do something? So you really have to look at everything you can to figure, is this agent what they say there? And then you respect that agent because everything comes from the agent, from the guy you've turned. There are some operations in which you're then trying to destroy an organisation where you could use prosthetics, you could dress in a different way, you could put a wig on, you could do whatever. Frankly, we Brits, yes, we'll use wigs and stuff like that. But we're not as good as the Americans on the far down of it. The Americans, the CIA, which is our equivalent, okay, they will use Hollywood techniques, even down to, you know, the rubber masks you see, Mission Impossible. They use that. They use proper disguises. They can sit with you with a proper mask on like that and you'll think it's a proper person. But then, of course, they're spending billions, literally, on making things happen. We Brits do it in a, in a little bit of a different way in agent running. And indeed, back in the height of the Cold War, in fact, Sometimes the Americans needed to come to us right. to say, for us to run a, a spy for them in the Soviet Union, because we were better at it. So better at the spy craft, but they're better at those sort of techniques. And there are a massive worldwide organisation, which we are, but we just don't have the funds and that. But what we do, I think, personally, I think we run an agent better in that way. No, that's in MI6. Now, in Special Branch, yes, agents are again your bread and butter. So you're running agents, but this is internally now in the United Kingdom. So you're trying to get an agent, whatever the organisation might be, extreme left-wing organisation, extreme right-wing organisation, organisation which are trying to undermine the country. It might be a an organisation that, let's say, Libya example in the old days, when its agents were in here trying to kill Libyans and others, or in fact, feed information or feed weaponry to the IRA. So you're running agents in those sort or in the IRA the, the special branch had responsibility for defeating the IRA on mainland Britain but we would run agents through that so you can do that way now what you're also talking about is you're talking about entering an organization undercover you call that natural cover and you do that all the time in my six you're a businessman you're this you're that a sports you can be whatever it fits to get somebody to do something internally in the branch you could be Again, whatever, to go to meetings, to understand people, to work with people, to get them to recruit you into their organisation. But you come onto a very sensitive area because that can be extremely long term and frankly, extremely damaging to your health in extremely long term. Yeah, those are sensitive and dangerous areas. Have you ever been in, on such an operation? Those, those are extremely sensitive and dangerous areas. And yes, and if you read my book, you will understand the sort of areas that I've been involved in, in, in both organisations in special branch. Yeah, because it's bread and butter. It is bread and butter, but they are where things get sensitive. Okay. Okay, so we've got a question here from Charlotte. She's asking whether you have experienced any mental challenges as part of your job role. Absolutely. I'm going to be absolutely truthful to you. The secret world is a duplicitous world. It can be downright nasty and you have to come to terms with why you think what you are doing is correct. For me, I believed I was saving lives. I know I've saved lives. I know I've saved many lives. But I believed that I was preventing people 
from being used in order to cause problems in the downfall within the United Kingdom and indeed around the world. So dealing with terrorist example are that some of the plots are designed to cause extremely mass casualties. The old-fashioned terrorists, let's say the old-fashioned Palestinian, even the IRA, generally what these people were not trying to do was just cause mass casualties, just for no reason. What they were trying to do was force the government or governments to hear their situation and to make it unpalatable to live as we are. And for to take their situation seriously, the problem is with particularly terrorism of an Islamic nature, and I'm talking about extremism now in that sense, that it's a battle to basically cause total mass casualties. There's also been other organisations that have attempted to do that. So there was a cult organisation coming up to the year 2000 in Japan who basically wanted to seed the clouds. Now, this is known, so I'm not saying anything ultra secret. And I've always got to be a bit cautious that we don't give anything away. They wanted to seed the clouds in Nagasaki and in Tokyo and basically kill millions of people. The attempt for us to, to test it was on the underground in, in Tokyo, where they are basically put a gas to kill as many people as possible. So what I'm saying is that this is now not just a game of one or two people being killed. This is now existential threat if things go wrong and things happen. And that plays on your mind. Other people may get hurt while you're trying to prevent this issue. Or sometimes you can't solve the issue. I give you an example of that. I tried to prevent them in Afghanistan after 9-11. I wasn't successful. And so what I know is that tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands have died as a result, tens of thousands, as a result of that being unsuccessful. I also wrote a paper at the time of before the Iraq trying to say, listen, we should not involve ourselves in that action. But you can only do what you can do. And so your nation sometimes takes a different road than you'd want to take in dealing with various issues. So yes, there is a mental part to that, which you have to try to deal with. But I would argue that you cannot come away from some of the operations that I've undertaken, particularly long-term operations, which we spoke about previously, where you will not be damaged because you will be. And has it ever got to a point where what you're being asked to do, you don't agree with that much that you've had to say no? No, it hasn't got to a point of what I've been asked to do. It, the reason why I'm being a little bit sheepish on that, it, I've turned down a role which I was asked to do, basically to be the head of the special branch in Iraq. As I said to you before, I wrote a paper saying we should not involve ourselves in the Iraq war because all you'll do is kill a whole lot of people and make a lot of people hate the West. And it will make the Islamic problem a great terroristic problem, greater, not less. And by the way, we need to understand that when I talk about Islamic terrorism, it could just as easily be Christian terrorism if Christianity felt itself under the same element of threat that Islam feels itself under the element of some people within Islam. And you see that in America, Timothy McVeigh, to give you just one example of, of the Christian right doing things in that sense. What I'm saying is there was a role that I, that, that I was kind of hijacked near I on to take the most senior British officer and second in command in Iraq after we'd won the Iraq, the fighting stage, won it? the fighting stage of the Iraq war. A, a great general and a great guy, General Sir Freddie Figures. And there was also then the Assistant Commissioner for Specialist Operations, another great guy, David Vaness at, at Scotland Yard, who was basically head up of all the specialist operations at Scotland Yard, including the Special Branch. And then there was the head of station, by head of station, that's the head of MI6 in Baghdad, and these guys, I was in Baghdad, what the war was finished, but the subversion was going on and the insurgency was going on. And I told them, and they said, listen, we'd like you to take over and be the head of the Iraqi secret police. I said, no. And I explained why. When I'd explained why, and I'll go into some of the explanation, but not all of it. When I explained why, I said, well, that's exactly why we want you to be there. Because you understand the situation. Because you've been in the service, you've been in the branch, you've been in whatever. You understand these things. You have close relations with Americans. So we'd like for you to be that man who runs the Iraqi secret police. And I said, listen, having studied Iraq and been on the Iraq side, I know that those guys pulled out fingernails under Saddam, that those guys were chopping people up and whatever else they needed to do to keep the lid on the Iraqi situation. You've now gone back to those days. And in order to bring Iraq to what it needs to be, whomever takes that over is probably going to go down that road because you've got the ludicrous situation now 
whereby I give you one example of an incident that happened. They basically put an advert in a paper saying they want a whole load of people to come and be electricians. But what you need to understand is after the war had ended, there was no work. So anybody who read that thought, I'm going to be an electrician. So they had about five buses. Come on the buses, get on it. So these people got on and they blew each bus up and killed them. Hundreds of people just killed like that. That was the type of dastardly stuff that was going on. Day in, day out in Iraq. It was a hellhole. And whoever took over the secret police for the whole of Iraq would need to stem that violence. And basically to do that, you'd have to rehire the people that Saddam had because they know where the people were who were carrying out these actions. I may have been absolutely successful and stopped all this going on, stopped what happened in Fallujah later on where tens of thousands of people lost their life, stopped all of the issues. But I'll tell you what would have happened. The politicians would have forgotten and five years later I'd be in The Hague ripping the rails for war crimes because the politicians are more duplicitous than anybody else. They only care about today, sort today's issue out. And tomorrow, they never knew what was going on. So what I'm saying to you is that in this world, you have to CYA. Okay, so we've got a question from Mark here. It's back to the old James Bond. He said, do you have a license to kill or would there ever be a situation where someone would have a license to kill? Okay, so in the Intelligence Services Act that put MI5 and MI6 on a legal footing, and what you need to understand is until the 1990s, late 1990s in fact, there was no such thing as MI5 and MI6, officially. Unofficially, people knew it. When I joined the Special Branch, everything we did was secret, even what the roles were we were meant to carry out, because that's how over-secretive the UK was. And, and we were police. So we were working within the law, okay? The internal service, MI5, real name, the security service, also had to work in the law round about. But you do have authorizations from government to overstep the position and the branch assisted in those processes. Now, the external service, MI6, security service, which James Bond is and which I was a case officer, clearly you have to have the authority to carry out acts that are not legal. Because if you go to some country and you say you're Jack Jones when you enter into that country, the, are you just being Jack Jones on entering another country with a passport that says Jack Jones? And I've had a thousand and one different names and been in different countries. You're carrying out something that's against the law. So the act basically says if you're carrying out the law on behalf of queen and country and it's authorised, then you can carry out acts that are required in order to do that. Okay. So if you look at it that way, there is a licence to do most things, if not everything, once it's authorised. Maybe that the war on terror, that you have to get coordinates or your agent can get you coordinates where a person might be and then that person is obliterated by a drone. So effectively you've killed that person, okay? So Joe Soap is at coordinate 84587. Is that right? These are the questions of greater good. These are questions of you're in a war, foot in war scenario. These people are trying to kill a whole lot of people. It's your role to prevent that process. So in that way, perspective could be perceived in that fashion. But there is no willy-nilly thing where people going around killing people willy-nilly, like some crazy thing on some crazy movie. That's not the case. Again, if I put that into a different context, in my role as a protection officer and running a protection team, and being in Afghanistan, Iraq, Yemen, Colombia, you name wherever was dangerous I've been there in that particular role. Obviously, if somebody comes to attempt to assassinate the person, and that person is obviously a grade A VIP, President, Prime Minister, Foreign Secretary, Foreign Secretary, whatever, of your country, then you can obviously protect that person by maybe taking that other person's life. Indeed, you'd have to do that because you're putting your own life on the line. If that person wants to kill, that person's going to kill you. So that's the reality of the circumstance. So yes, in that sense there is, but it's nobody with a license running around thinking willy-nilly, as I'm saying, because this is a very serious, extremely serious perspective. And you've got to look at it from that perspective. Now, let me be clear. I don't believe that anybody be a prime minister or a president, is better than me. However, the role that I've taken on is to protect that individual with my team. And I use all sort of assets in order to do that. I can use a whole host of assets that, that I can just grab hold of from, from different countries. In fact, I can use a helicopter from here. I can use whatever in order to try and make something happen. And I do that to keep this person alive. Why? Because what a lot of people don't understand is 
If, for example, the Secretary of State for Defence for the United Kingdom was killed in Afghanistan or in Iraq, it would guarantee that we kept fighting that war. It would guarantee it. There's no way they could take that hit and say, oh, we'll do nothing about it. We'd still be fighting that war longer because that person had died. Do you see what I mean, Dan? You're going to keep fighting the war when, frankly, you want a way out. You don't want to have to be pushed because it would be seen as a victory for the terrorist and the state could not allow the terrorist to be perceived as a victory. Okay, so you mentioned there about various passports and different names. Have you ever found yourself in a situation whereby maybe you've slipped up? or yeah, said a wrong name or identified as someone else but when you perhaps shouldn't have? No, no. That's your bread and butter. That's your tradecraft. That's what you learn. That's what keeps you alive. That is what makes you be able to come home to your family. If you do that wrong, you may lose your life. So you, and, and, and even if it's something less innocuous than lose your life, let's say you into a state and you do something, they've got you. Now you've got a massive diplomatic problem because they're going to make a problem out of that diplomatically. And they may throw you in prison for a while and then you're going to maybe exchange somebody for you and all the rest of it. So you get a big problem from that. So no, these are the things you've really got to hone in on and, and understand. Now what happens is you can be back here in the UK and you've got several agents around the world and they may call or somebody may call you trying to make an agent and then for a split second when that call comes in on it, you know, you've got several, eight, nine, ten different forms or whatever they might be. And for a split second when that comes in, you think to yourself, who am I on this one? That's where the job is difficult. It's all about the mindset. It's all about understanding. It's all about being professional. It's all about knowing your role and what you do. And that's why only very few people of the organisation actually carry that type of role out. Okay, so we've got another question here from Rob, and he just wants to know your views on 9-11 and whether it was an inside job. That's an interesting one. I can't think why it would be, and I can't think how many people would need to be involved. And more importantly, I know it wasn't because I know the circumstance. What I would say now is I earlier spoke to you about a politician. It's not an inside job. Let's clear that up straight away. I'm going to give you a, a quick run through. If you go back, and I don't know how many of you youngsters remember, if you're younger, but the older people will, remember the Cold War. If you go back to the Cold War and you remember when President Najibullah asked for the Soviet Union to assist him to defeat what was then an insurgency into Afghanistan and the Soviet Union came in, let's make it clear, not Russians, the Soviet Union, because all the 15 republics were together at that stage. They came in and they fought a war there. The guy who ran the CIA, the station chief, the head of station in the CIA in Islamabad, was thinking, how could he defeat the Soviets in Afghanistan and give them a bloody nose like the Soviets had aided and given the Americans a bloody nose in Vietnam? And he thought, I know what, let's make this a religious war. Let's turn around and say, the Soviets, they're not believers. We Americans are believers. You are believers in Islam. We're of the same book. So he then started to give assistance to madrasas. Now, I'm not telling you anything secret because it's come out. And the madrasas are the training schools where the Taliban come in to train and, and they'll understand that. And that was funded by the CIA and the Pakistanis. So what happened is these guys who were then training to do this became the, if you will, the body politic that became the organisations, particularly that were pushing out the Soviets. And they also looked at foreign fighters like bin Laden and assisted these foreign fighters to come in and carry it out, carry out these actions. So if you read bin Laden's proclamation, his first fatwa against the United States, what he says is, when I came in to attack the Soviet and get rid of these atheists, you told me we're all of the book and we're all together. Why is it that you are now in the land of the seven pillars? By that he means in Saudi Arabia. Why have you gone against the book? Now I will hate you and I'll take action against you. So what he was basically saying is, you told me one thing and now you're doing something else. Now, from the CIA's perspective, obviously what they were told by the government was defeat the Soviets. And actually, we don't care you do it, just defeat them. Okay? It's the Cold War, end them. Especially under the Reagan administration, he was putting billions into it. He wanted the evil empire, as he called it. So everything was game in. So this is what they did forward. The problem is they created a Frankenstein that later would come back and bite them. Because once the Soviets had left Afghanistan and the Soviet Union was then defeated in 1991, and it split then into the Russian Federation, then into Russia, the 15 republics split off. So you've got Azerbaijan, you've got all the different Soviets, the Ukraine, Estonia, all, all different former Soviet countries that are now their own independent countries. And the Cold War had ended. That was the end of the interest of the US. 
So Afghanistan carried on and the Taliban take over and they brought in a dastardly regime. Whereas before, under the Soviets, women in Kabul, yes, not necessarily outside of Kabul, but in Kabul and in the universities wearing miniskirts and all that sort of getting it and going to education, that had been gone. They are now covered from top to tail and gloved and can't come out and get educated. So we take our time, we talk about with educating women, we take that, we don't forget all that Soviet time, we just take it from the time after the Taliban. But if you go to the time before the Taliban and the Soviets mm. were, were in, and it was a communist state, women were treated relatively equal in the cities, in the urban areas. So what I'm saying is that sometimes the goal's made, politicians do it, the goal's made, it's finished, and then something else comes back to bite you what you've created to achieve today's goal. Because the politicians turn around and say, oh, fantastic job, CIA, you do well. But that job will bite them later on because it's all about achieving something today. Tomorrow is sometimes forgotten. That can be a problem with an intelligence agency because all of the intelligence agencies of the West work to governments. They, they don't work to themselves. This conspiracy element that they're all working from, no, no, they're working to government in a sense. So that's how they can be problematic particularly intelligence. Security is different because you're working inside your country and you're trying to do something inside your country to prevent it falling away. So that's a different kettle of fish. So you'd have to look on 9-11 at the FBI and say, what did the FBI know, the internal body? What did it know? And believe me, it tried hard. And I know for sure that the CIA tried very hard to prevent 9-11, extremely hard. I know as a fact to prevent it. So no, there was no conspiracy theory of the US causing its own downfall in that way. It caused its downfall by causing the downfall of its primary enemy some 10 years earlier, if you get what I'm saying. That's that's the corollary of that process. Dan, thanks very much for the questions. In the future, we'll put another question show on. If you want to know more about me, then please do get my book. You can get it from any good platform, or indeed you can get it on Kindle as an ebook or, or any of those other platforms that do that. And of course, the show is comes out every Wednesday on all of the major podcast platforms so you can listen to us at any time and hope you do and we'll see you next week Carlton King is a real life working class spy bringing you the details, the stories and secrets from his life spent spying. Give us a five star rating on Apple iTunes and don't forget to subscribe so you never miss any of the excitement. This is for your ears only. My name's Carlton King. And I'm an ex-spy. This podcast was produced by a podcast company. If you need help with your podcast, simply visit a podcastcompany.com or email Jason at a podcastcompany.com.